All right, hey everyone, thanks for joining. Could I get a heads up if you can hear me okay in chat? And see my screen okay? Awesome, hey Sonny, welcome back, good sir. Thanks for joining, sweet. All right, so where did we leave off last time? Um, last week and the week prior to that. Uh, so the first stream we did, we developed a just a driver mode policy or KMCI kernel mode code integrity policy. Rationale being this was Windows Defender application control on easy mode, right? Defender application control allows you to have separate kernel mode and user mode policies. You can merge them together, um, but because the set of drivers that are required to boot and run the operating system uh, is relatively small and doesn't fluctuate terribly often, um, I figured that would be a good place to, to start. Um, and it turns out it really wasn't too bad to develop that policy. Again, um, we started with the Windows, the default Windows Allow policy, uh, which we use from the template, which is contained in C Windows schemas, code integrity example policies. So great template policies to use there. We started by having a policy that only allowed Windows signed code to execute. And then we use that as our base template policy from which we built uh, upon that incrementally, starting with device drivers, right? So again, as you may know, uh, I'm running this VM uh, on my Mac using VMware Fusion. Um, so the drivers that I expected to have to incorporate into my allow list were the VMware specific drivers. And there were no other ones that were required other than the Windows signed ones, right? And as an example to show that uh, we were successfully blocking drivers, I actually think I still have it here. I use the read write everything driver as an example of the kind of driver that we'd want to prevent from executing in our environment. I don't think I ever cleaned this up. So we'll do sc.exe start and I named it read writes everything. So why is that running? <laughs> All right, so uh, apparently we got a little, little bit of troubleshooting to do here. Uh, I was not expecting the read write everything driver to be running as that should not have been allowed per policy. Um, if we're gonna troubleshoot this, this reminds me, I never did cover how you would be able to determine if Defender Application Control was running in the first place. There's a couple ways to do that. And honestly, it's not super intuitive. So let me help you all out here. Built-in commandlet, get computer info. One of the last properties that'll pop up is device guard uh, let's see, device guard security services running. Uh, okay, so device guard code integrity policy enforcement status. Oh, claims that it's an audit mode. Oh, okay, so that would explain that, that perhaps somehow the policy that I deployed recently was in uh, audit mode. And uh, we can confirm with the logs here. Now again, just um, 
as a refresher, this audit function that I use is in the WDAC tools module that I developed and it's on GitHub. So we, we've been using this pretty extensively. Oh, sorry, wrong one. Co uh, code, what was it? Code integrity events. Let's just look at the kernel events and since last policy refresh and see what pops up. And this should allow me to distinguish if it's in audit or enforcement mode, which indeed it is. Okay, so problem solved. I screwed up my deployment. Um, this is on me. Um, another thing that we covered last week when building a user mode policy was that there are two event logs that you need to consider when auditing user mode code integrity events. There's the code integrity event log, but also the app locker MSI and script event log. So with user mode enforcement enabled, any portable executable file is going to be logged in the code integrity log. So what do I mean by portable executable or PE file, um, DLL, exe, dot sys, um, anything, uh, regardless of file extension, if it is a valid portable executable file, um, then that will be logged in the code integrity log. Uh, apologies if there's some background noise, we got some yard work going on outside, so try to disregard that. All right, uh, and then the app locker log, um, anything that is not a PE that is subject to policy enforcement is going to be logged there. So um, script code, which includes PowerShell scripts, VB script, J script, and MSI installers are all going to be logged there. So I've showed off this function quite a bit for auditing the code integrity log. And I briefly showed last time the other audit script you can use to, um, to audit and parse out the relevant app locker script MSI logs. All right, because last time what we encountered was that every time we started PowerShell, we would get an error related to constrained language mode. And um, my PowerShell profile has some code in there that is not conformant with constrained language mode. Um, now I don't have time unfortunately today to dive into constrained language mode enforcement. We'll cover that in another stream. Um, but what I did just prior to starting this stream was I went ahead and created a policy that would allow my profile.ps1 script to run. So as a quick refresher, what we've developed thus far is the following. So we've created the following policies here. So we created a dedicated policy for GVIM, for VMware device drivers, VMware user mode code, the Microsoft C runtime library, which is Microsoft signed, it's not Windows signed. There's an important distinction there. Windows signed code is Microsoft code that uses a special certificate that indicates that it is Microsoft signed code that was included in box in a Windows image, All right? Pretty much anyone at Microsoft can obtain a run of the mill uh, Microsoft code signing certificate and pretty much sign code to their heart's content. Um, that's the kind of stuff that I would like to avoid just blanket authorizing out of the box. Um, I don't want to trust that. So that's why I have a dedicated policy for the Microsoft C runtime code, um, which is going to be a very common dependency for um, a large amount of software installations. And then I also just created a, um, a PowerShell script um, uh, policy like to allow my profile script to, to execute. All right. Um, and I have my base policy, which again is that default Windows template policy, um, which just allows Windows signed code to run and nothing else. 
So we're using that as our base template and supplementing all these additional policies to that. And our workflow thus far has been we take all of those together and merge them into a single policy. All right. And the command to do that was this. All right. And remember, when you specify the policy paths, the order of them is very important. So the first policy file that you specify is the one that will have all of its file rule options kept intact. All right. The file rule options will not be maintained or merged from the other policies. What do I mean by file rules? I mean things like audit mode. Um, what else? All right, unsigned policies, all these rules here. Okay, those will not be merged and only the first policy uh, gets to keep those. Okay, very important to remember that if you're merging your policies. Okay, next step is to convert the merged XML, excuse me, merge XML policy to a binary policy and we're deploying it all in a single step. So copying it to the code integrity log. And then the last step, if you want to refresh your policy without rebooting, you can do that using a little WMI. All right, um, this, this is documented uh, through Microsoft, okay? Um, kind of annoying that there's no other way to do this policy refreshment. Um, but that's just the way it is. But uh, at least this can lend itself to improved automation. Like we could write a PowerShell function, like refresh dash code integrity policy or something like that. Like that's not hard, okay? All right. All right, so that summarizes what we've done thus far. Now, this to me is not sufficient why? Well, because of the law bins. So C Microsoft.net framework. Okay. Um, MS build, as many of you may know, is probably one of the most common, commonly abused uh, law bin or living off the land binary out there. So the problem is this is allowed to run even though uh, we don't want it to run because it can be abused by attackers to execute arbitrary unsigned code in a fashion that is not code integrity aware. All right. We're not going to get into the nitty gritty details of um, why it's not code integrity aware, um, but you're just gonna to have to trust me that, that it is. There's other resources online that will dive into those details further. Um, but the reason MS build, and here's a good opportunity here to see this again. The reason MS build is allowed to run is because it's Windows signed. It was included in box. So how do we confirm that something is indeed Windows signed? All right, so we have our signer information here. We're gonna to go to signer certificates. Uh, we can expand out all these properties so you can get a sense of what properties are available. And the property that we want to view is enhanced key usage list. All right, so this seems pretty clearly like this is Microsoft signed. And we have confirmation that it is Windows signed because of this specific enhanced key usage or EKU that is specified. That Windows System Component Verification, if that is applied to the Microsoft Code Signing Certificate, that's how you know it's Windows signed. And per our policy, we allow all Windows signed code to run. Thus, we've opened up a, a potential Pandora's box of post-exploitation tradecraft where an attacker can execute arbitrary unsigned code 
assuming the attacker, of course, is aware of what those lull bins are and how to abuse them properly, okay? So our goal today in our short period of time today um, is to figure out how we can effectively block those abusable binaries. So let's start with some wonderful Microsoft documentation. And I mean that with all seriousness, this is fantastic stuff right here. I posted this link in the chat, um, but for future reference, yeah, just Google Microsoft recommended block rules. Gives you a little bit of context about the binaries that are relevant for blocking. Like generally what you're gonna see here are executables and scripts that permit the execution of arbitrary unsigned code. Or in the case of scripts, like PowerShell scripts, facilitate circumventing constrained language mode, okay? So in here we see things like CDB, um, WinDBG, okay? So we have debuggers. Debuggers kind of make sense, right? Like if you've used a, a debugger, you would know that you can attach to any process and you have full control over the memory of the process that you're attached to. You can even modify registers directly. Like you can set the EIP or RIP register directly to the address of your choosing and it will happily jump to the address that you specify. So obviously we don't want this in a heavily secured environment, the ability to attach to a process and completely control the uh, memory space and code execution of executables. Uh, other things are like WMIC. This was a finding of Casey Smith, where he found that uh, WMIC will consume or can consume an XSL file. And in an XSL file, you can have embedded uh, Windows script host code. So VBScript or JScript. And thanks to James Forshaw, um, we have the uh, .NET to uh, JScript capability, right? So this is what um, allows attackers to unlock the previous restrictions that VBScript and JScript imposed on you to facilitate truly arbitrary unsigned code execution in VBScript and JScript code. All right, so uh, Wimic would have facilitated this. All right, uh, some other things included. So MS Build, plenty of resources on how to use MS Build to uh, have it compile your C Sharp code and load it in a fashion that is not subject to code integrity enforcement. Um, and then there's several um, like language interpreters. So FSI is the F sharp interpreter, CSI, the C sharp interpreter, and various other uh, lull bins that would facilitate arbitrary unsigned code execution. So scrolling down a little bit, uh, Microsoft is, uh, was nice enough to, um, to give credit to reporters of these bypasses. So thank you, Microsoft, for the for the shout outs here. There's some awesome contributions here from some, some great researchers. Um, now, as an attacker, what I would recommend is that perhaps you subscribe to any updates for this documentation. Like this is all just backed by GitHub. So you can just go up here to, uh, to edit. And you'll see like, it's just a markdown. So like if you subscribe to updates, here, anytime uh, Microsoft adds any lull bins to this list, as an attacker, you'll probably be the first to know. Um, and so the race is potentially yours to win against uh, defenders trying to catch up to um, detect or prevent those additions. All right, so what is Microsoft giving you? They're giving you a full Defender Application Control Policy for free here. Um, consisting 
entirely of block rules. Okay, so we're not going to have any allow rules in here. And let's, um, I've already copied this into a file. Let's start to parse this out a little bit and make some sense of what we're dealing with here. Okay. So let's start with the first file rule here. So here's a deny rule named after BG info, where it's the file name attribute is BG info. Some of you may recall from previous streams where file name originates from. This is not the file name on disk. All right, this is the original file name resource in the PE file. All right, so what does that mean? That means that uh, if an attacker were to drop, in this case, BG info onto disk and rename the original file name from BG info to whatever, PowerShell.exe, it is not going to be allowed to execute per policy because by uh, altering that resource, that original file name, you have invalidated the signature of that binary. And so it, it will no longer be subject to um, being allowed to, to run in, in your policy, All right? So that's original file name and minimum file version. These are kind of weird to interpret for deny rules. Um, it's confusing the, the naming they use. So it says minimum file version, but what this, my, my understanding is what this is supposed to mean is um, any file version up to and include, uh, I don't know. Someone's going to have to fact check me here, but up to and including version 4.21.0.0 will not be allowed to run. Anything after that version will be allowed to run, right? So um, it was Advar Mo who made this discovery, uh, reported it responsibly to, to Microsoft. And in short time, Mark Rosinovich published uh, an update for it. Um, uh, then later on, I reported another bypass for the, uh, for the fix, uh, Mark fixed that as well. And he iterated the, um, or incremented the, the file version, right? So this should reflect the most recent version of BG info that is no longer, uh, subject to, but the bypassing of code integrity. Um, but what this rule specifies is that we should be able to, um, we wanna be able to block downgrade attacks, right? Where an attacker could, would attempt to drop older versions, older vulnerable versions of BG info to achieve arbitrary code execution, all right? So I think it's really cool that Microsoft gives you the option to specify the file version, all right? So we've covered file versions in the past for in the context of allow rules, but now we're talking about them in the context of, of deny rules. Um, when you see this like maximum version number here, the way you interpret that is independent of file version, all of them will just be blocked, right? So there is no version of WinDBG, the debugger that is subject to proper code integrity enforcement, right? So, um, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Um, it doesn't make sense for Microsoft to conceivably make WinDBG code integrity aware, like for a debugger, that just doesn't make sense. All right. Cool. Uh, Fleming, uh, thank you. Yeah. So, Avar says 4.2.2 .2 is not vulnerable, so uh, must be up to and including. Okay, cool. Yeah, so like our, that makes sense. And our hope is that Microsoft is also updating this policy as those uh, lull bins are being uh, mitigated and updated accordingly. Cool, so yeah, Sunny, you interpret this, the version as block 
greater than and equal to. Or you mean, do you mean block less than and equal to? Because <laughs> like, if bginfo 4.2.2 is the one that is no longer vulnerable, then we want to be able to execute that. So again, pretty uh, unintuitive here based on the naming, but anyway, you just have to deal with that. Okay, uh, so here are the remaining lull bins that are blocked. I've already covered some of these here. Um, let's go through some others. So I believe it was Jimmy Bain or uh, Bohop on Twitter. Um, and what's the other guy's name? Philip, Philip Superman. Um, released some pretty cool tradecraft around um, uh, subverting code integrity using uh, script hosts and, and XML. So there's a good blog post about that. And this was Microsoft's response to dealing with that, which was kind of a pain to be honest. So they're like, all right, depending upon your Windows build, like this is the, um, these are the rules that you should have. But fortunately, um, you, this no longer applies if you're using Windows 10, 1903 and above. So for all intents and purposes, we can leave all these rules commented out because that is unnecessary complexity that I would prefer to not have to deal with. All right. Um, the last portion of this includes uh, block rules for scripts. So uh, unfortunately, we don't get any context as to what the heck Microsoft is actually blocking here. Um, it would be nice to get that context. Certainly nice as an attacker to be like, hey, what does Microsoft deem uh, worthy of, of blocking, right? Um, but we don't get that. Um, but uh, between myself, uh, various other researchers like Matt Nelson, Lee Christensen, um, and a handful of others, uh, we've all collectively reported a ton of uh, PowerShell and VBScript based bypasses that subvert code integrity. And unfortunately, you, so like these rules here, right? Like in PE files, we have valuable metadata that we can use for the basis of an allow or a block rule, namely original file name and file version. Do we get that metadata in a script file? No. So the only option, the only option we have is to block by hash. And that's pretty unfortunate. Why? Two reasons. So, um, if you're gonna block something by hash, then those script based those script based bypasses are gonna be like Pokemon. You have to catch them all in order to be effective at initially blocking them. Now, another situation that arises is when you have when you have script code that has an embedded authentic code signature in it, this is problematic from a block rule perspective. Why? So I linked to this in the chat, but the blog post I wrote is this one here, okay? So it turns out that um, if you have a script, VBScript, JScript, or PowerShell script with an embedded authentic code signature, right? So presumably it's signed by Microsoft or Windows signed, and it can be used to subvert code integrity, a block rule cannot be created for it, right? So yes, you can block the hash, block the file hash, but there are some subtle tricks you can do to tweak the uh, embedded authentic code signature such that you flip a bit without invalidating the signature 
and by flipping that bit, um, you you change the the file hash. So what was blocked by hash before is no longer blocked because you've created a new file hash while remaining the while um, maintaining the integrity of the uh, code signing signature, right? So um, this issue is tricky. Um, it hasn't been fixed. Um, so that's that's unfortunate. So really, um, effectively, like you can disregard most of these uh, hash-based rules because they aren't effective. So I'm completely open to being proven wrong about that. Like if something has changed, if so, uh, speak up. Anyone from Microsoft, speak up. But um, that's just the reality that we have to deal with. So that's unfortunate. And we got James Forshaw in here. Hey man, thanks a lot for joining. So put the hash into virus total. Oh yeah, good call, good call. Yeah, so just just copy that hash into virus total, and then it will um, it will associate often associate that hash with the uh, file name that was used to upload it from. So <laughs> that's that's a fantastic call. Thank you, James. Love that. Okay. All right, so what we'd like to do now is um, incorporate this into our policy and start blocking some of these things from, from executing. All right, so let's start with the traditional workflow that we've been employing thus far, which is take all of these and the default Windows policy and merge them into a single policy and then deploy that. Okay, that should be easy enough. So let me pull up the last merge. And then the only one we're gonna add now is MS block rules. Okay. I don't know why that outputs anything. It doesn't really do me any good. Because all I care about is the XML that was generated. All right. So let me just do a quick sanity check. So we do have user mode code integrity enabled. Audit mode is enabled. I'm okay with that for now. Um, let's, so, okay, we have a bunch of our allow rules. Let's scan real quick for our block rules. Yep, okay, cool. So those appear to be in place. And now we can call convert from CI policy. Here we go. Done. Now that's not going to take effect until we reboot or refresh the policy. Let us refresh the policy. Okay, and let's see what we get when we try to load MS build again. Oops. Well, all right. Maybe we have some debugging to do. Um, let's see if anything did Let's see if any events did surface since our last policy refresh, which was like a few seconds ago. So what do we got here? Oh, derp, yeah. Um, it was a lot to run because it was in audit mode. See, this, this gets me all the time. Um, so it would have been blocked, but you see the um, that it was in audit mode, but yeah. So anyway, that's cool. Um, Hey, why don't we roll the dice and just throw this bad boy, bad girl into, uh, enforcement mode. Why not? 
do it live. Okay, um, so yeah, we're gonna convert that to a binary policy, refresh. Okay, cool. All right, so now um, this should be reflected accordingly. So MS build was blocked in enforcement mode. It's parent process was PowerShell. Um, and you get the, the nice meta, well, you, you get lots of nice stuff. So um, yeah, quick, quick refresher. Um, so the requested signing level, my understanding is when the signing level is enterprise, that corresponds to um, the expectation being that the signature validation is going up against a code integrity policy, right? There are different signing levels. For example, um, you have to be a, um, like there's a protected process signing level. There's a Microsoft signing level. There's a Windows signing level. So enterprise corresponds specifically to a configurable code integrity policy which is what we've been deploying here. Now the, the validated signing level is uh, surfaced as unsigned, which um, I don't know. I, I don't really know how to properly interpret that because M MS build is signed, um, but perhaps it's surfacing as uh, saying it's unsigned because it was specified in a, um, a deny rule. I, I don't know, to, to be honest. Um, we get the nice context of the, the policy good, the policy ID, and the name that we've specified. So if we're dealing with multiple policies, uh, which we will dive into, um, actually, I, I think we're going to start diving into this here in, in a minute. I, I would like to um, try to start diving into that because that's going to be important later on as we build upon these concepts. And then we get all this um, uh, PE metadata, which is pretty useful as well. So um, in Twitter earlier on, Casey mentioned that he would like to see coverage of uh, things being renamed. So let's see, he said specifically things like renaming, relocated, etc. Okay, so cool. All right, let's copy ms build to notepad.exe locally and just as a sanity check here you'll see the standard notepad is allowed to run but the one in the current working directory is indeed not allowed to run why because those file rules that are specified in our code integrity policy refer again to the original file name. Okay. By me copying MS build to notepad, the MS build.exe original file name is intact. Right. So that's why that's not allowed to run. And if any such attempt by an attacker was made to rename and or relocate an abusable binary, we get some good context. All right, should be in our first event here. Okay, notepad.exe tried to run from PowerShell. And what do we have here? Original file name, MS build, Microsoft. Cool. Um, that's awesome. Like, so hopefully I've just proven or highlighted the value of getting this PE metadata surfaced in these event log in the code integrity events. That is super, super, super valuable, right? Because if you are in a position to be, uh, baselining, uh, expected 
binary names versus original file name and path from which they're expected to execute and there's a deviation from that well you got a potential problem on your hands of course that logic could be false positive prone um but anyway just um it's, it's a nice heuristic to have in your back pocket to rely upon if you have the the privilege to um have this level of event log insight via the code integrity event log agree brian this is super cool that defender application control surfaces these events and uh Defender Exploit Guard does not give you the, um, the P metadata. Um, okay, so let's do this. With the time that we have left, why don't we fumble our way through an introduction to multiple policies, all right? And I say fumble because like this is a new feature and uh, I get it screwed up all the time. So once I get it working properly, it's like, I don't want to touch my base policies when I have multiple policies. It, it can get a little, a little ugly. Um, AJ437 is asking, uh, what was the command to debug the block not working? The block not working. Um, I think what you're referring to is uh, in the event log, like when I run get WDAC code integrity event, event type will be audit versus enforce. Hopefully that, that's what you were looking for to validate. And then just as a, when it failed to block. Um, let me see if this answers your question. So I did get computer info to assess the current status of device guard or defender application control enforcement. And so again, device guard is the old uh, product name for defender application control. Code integrity policy enforcement status is in enforcement mode. So um, that was the, the validation there. So hopefully that answers your question. All right, cool. So uh, why do we care about multiple policies? couple reasons. All right. So I stated that among the rich data that you get in the code integrity event logs is the policy name and policy GUID for the policy that triggered the event. Um, that's not very useful or not super useful in my opinion, if you only have a single policy, but let's say conceivably you had separate policies with different scopes, right? Like, a dedicated policy to just user mode enforcement, a dedicated policy to just driver allow rules, and a dedicated policy to just uh, lol bin block rules or lol driver quote unquote block rules, all right? That would be cool to have um, those block rules in their own dedicated policy because then if they were blocked, then we could better attribute the, um, the policy from which uh, the event was surfaced, right? Um, another thing that it facilitates is mixed mode enforcement. So for example, if it was not immediately feasible to just blanket block all of those known law bins, um, for example, if like, I don't know, for some reason, like some hosts needed to run MS build, you have mixed mode enforcement. So every other policy could be an enforcement mode. And then just while in tuning, you could have a separate dedicated policy just in uh, audit mode, which is pretty cool. So you're not necessarily like completely compromising the security of uh, of a host in enforcement mode while while tuning or not even tuning um, you could have another you could have multiple policies another one in audit mode that you just want to use to supplement your telemetry all right 
So that would be a cool use case as well. All right, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna copy the original MS block rule, and we're gonna work with this and try to make this um, a separate policy. So what we're gonna do to start is call a commandlet called set CI policy ID info. We give it a file path. All right, our MS block rules copy. And we specify reset policy ID. Um, you'll have to peruse through this documentation on um, to get some more context on how do you set CI policy ID info. Um, so it says, note that reset policy ID reverts a supplemental policy to a base policy and then resets the policy GUIDs back to a random GUID. So what the heck does that mean? Um, what I've done is I've converted this traditional like mergeable policy into a base policy that supports the new multiple policy format. Okay. So what is different is here at the bottom, there are now two elements added, this base policy ID and policy ID. The way that you know using the multiple policy format is that you're dealing with a base versus a supplemental policy is when base policy ID matches policy ID, okay? Now, massive, massive caveat when you're dealing with this. All right, so I want to read through this explicitly. So when we're dealing with multiple base policies, it says, for any execution to be allowed, the application must pass each base policy independently. Base policies are used together to further restrict what's allowed. For example, let's say a system has two policies, base policy A and B, with their own sets of rules. For foo.exe to be allowed to run, it must be allowed by the rules in base policy A and the rules in base policy B, okay? This tripped me up so bad when I first started dealing with this. Specifically, uh, when using the uh, Microsoft block rules as its own dedicated policy. Because let's come back to this one more time, okay? Um, let's replace foo with notepad.exe, right? Like we want to be able, we want our users to be able to run notepad.exe. All right, that's common sense. So in order for it to run, it must be allowed by both policies. But if this is going to be its own dedicated policy, there is no rule that specifies that notepad.exe is allowed to run. So it's going to fail. And the first time that I deployed this, <laughs> Uh, I bricked my OS because I had it in enforcement mode and I had this policy in audit mode thinking like, oh, like no problem. Even if this screws up like this, this part of the policy is in audit mode. Nope. Um, everything just failed by default. And um, if you ever place your policy into audit mode and like just blanket deny Windows code from allowing to run, um, things get interesting really, really quickly. Um, I encourage you to experiment with that sometime. It's, uh, it's an experiment in um, uh, oddities and pain in the OS. So anyway, uh, learn from my mistakes. Okay, uh, let's see if we can do this in a short period of time. So we have to, um, pardon me, I'm gonna pull up this other policy on my other computer. I'm just gonna manually add this rule. Okay, so this is where things get a little tricky. Um, sorry, I just have to look up one other thing in my policy. Okay. Um, okay. Um, you know what, here's what I need to do. 
And I might, I might run out of time here, so I apologize in advance for that. I should probably just dedicate a whole stream to multiple policies and supplemental policies. So C windows, schemas. Okay, allow all. Let's look at that one real quick. Yeah, let's go with this. All right, so I'm gonna copy this to my desktop and I'm going to merge CI policy, output file path, we'll do, call this allow all, or uh, we'll call this base block rules dot XML, policy paths, uh, let's do allow and MS block rules. Okay. So yeah, Brian, Brian says you basically have to test something against every base policy independently and maybe remember to start a lull bin deny block list policy from allow all starter. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, I'm merging all of the block rules into the allow all rule. Um, to facilitate this. Now I'm still going to need to call set set CI policy, so file path on that. And we're going to do reset to make this a, um, a supported base policy. And now we're going to, sorry for the back and forth here. We're going to take our other policy and remove the MS block rules from it because those are going to be in their own dedicated policy. Um, that should be in audit mode. Let's just, for safety purposes, let's ensure that everything is in audit mode. Okay, so merged. Looks like it's good to go. Let's look at our new base policy. Um, UMCI, yep, audit mode, update policy, no reboot. All right, so here's our allow all, followed by all of our denies. Uh, I think I need to also call this on merged. Okay, to make that like a properly supported base policy for multiple policies. Okay, so now, <laughs> um, here's the part I already forgot um, because I have code that abstracts all of this away. So actually, let's just go to the documentation. Um, use multiple policies. So I need to, when I convert these to binary format, I need to call them something specific uh, you'll have to copy the .cip files to CI policies active, okay? And you name them policy GUID.cip, all right? So here's where this like really kind of starts to suck, like if you're gonna be doing this manually. Again, this is why I wrote WDAC tools to abstract this complexity away. Uh, but we'll cover that um, in another day. So let me try to wrap this up and if this is working by uh, 6.30 Eastern here, then I will um, pat myself on the back. Okay, so first we need to take note of, sorry, take note of our policy goods, because that's what we need to name these CIP files to. Okay, no, not platform ID, policy ID. Did I mention this process sucks? Okay, so we're going to do convert from CI policy. XML file path is, um, let's do merged and we're gonna do C, Windows, Code Integrity, oh, System32. C, 
CI policies active. And then the name is I hope this is as painful for you watching as it is for me actually doing this. Now, PowerShell treats curly braces special as script lock, so we need to uh, take care of that. Okay. Okay, um, that's number one. Number two is going to be the base policy and its policy good is this, okay, dot CIP. And of course we got to change the policy path. All right. Um, And honestly here, like, let's just roll the dice and restart. It's like, I still don't have my confidence built up in this, like in doing it manually. Okay. And I also am not confident in how policy refreshing would work when you're transitioning from like the classic style of cone integrity policy to the multiple policy format. So just to be on the safe side, I'm rebooting. All right, so AJ437, um, you're asking, could you repeat the point about the same policy ID and base policy ID during the restart? Yeah, well, let me, uh, let me just show you. All right. So policy ID and base policy ID have to match if the policy that you're creating is a base policy. You can supplement base policies with supplemental policies. We haven't covered that yet. Um, so that's where the policy ID would be different from the base policy ID. but. By definition, a base policy has a policy ID and base policy ID good that are equal, okay? Ah, there's that bug again. Okay. Cannot dot source that. Huh. That should have been covered in my policy, but I'm sure I screwed something up. Um, so let's run notepad. Oh. The notepad, which is MS build. Okay. Oh, cool. So that was interesting. That was blocked. I'm actually not confident that the policy actually took because when I checked last, both of my base policies were in audit mode. Get WDAC code integrity event. It's last policy refresh. Notepad is in enforcement mode. Now, are any of the policy names different? Oh, um, what did we name? Our policy good too. It wasn't. Um, oh, that doesn't work. Um, let's do an LS on here. See Windows System 32. Okay, so our two policies are. This is our Windows policy and this is our block rule policy. So 4DB. And 4310. So, okay, there's that 4310. 
but this policy good should not be present. Okay, so um, hmm. uh, two things I want to do here. One is I'm going to edit this policy. And I meant, here, let's, or let's change this to um, block rules. Okay. And I'll I'll run a few minutes late here. All right, so flag CTF. Um, the question was, could the attacker rename the file name value in the PE file to bypass the vice guard? So I covered this um, a few minutes ago. The answer is no. If you uh, if you rename the file name on disk, like by copying MS build to Notepad.exe, um, that doesn't affect anything, like it's still gonna be blocked. And if you alter the original file name that the rule is based on in MS build, using that as an example, um, in doing so, you're gonna invalidate the signature of MS build, in which case it wouldn't be permitted to execute in the first place. Uh, yeah, so Fleming, that is my theory, thank you, um, that perhaps I want to remove the old stale SI policy P7B um, and then reboot. So, yep, um, that's exactly what I'm gonna try to do here. Clean things up a little bit, a little housekeeping. Let's um, recopy, redeploy those. Oh, I'm not in desktop. All right, so we got merged and we want our base policy. Okay. Uh, but trust me here and you're, you're gonna have to trust me. Like once you work out all the kinks in your multiple base policies, then generally things just kind of work and they work really well. Um, and especially when you're using supplemental policies to supplement a base policy. Um, my take is that base policies should rarely be updated and that it's the supplemental policies that should be subject to more frequent uh, maintenance. That's, the, that's a personal preference. All right, um, so uh, question flag CTF tracking, uh, the signature would be invalidated, yep. If they had to create a new binary then, that that would kind of defeat the purpose of using a lull, a lull bin. Right, so um, creating a new binary, um, I mean like if they dropped an unsigned binary, that's not gonna be allowed to run per policy, um, yeah. Not, not sure I understand the, the question fully, but yeah, feel, feel free to, to clarify. Okay, cool, thanks. Oh, that's in desktop. So clearly something is still screwed up because like my profile.ps1 should be allowed to run. Um, and we're gonna run our MS build and see here's here's the problem like that that should have been permitted to run and done in audit mode so uh, yeah Fleming um, Brian any any pointers you have this is where things definitely get uh, frustrating when dealing with this. Now, just for curiosity's sake.
All right. So like, it's interesting because like, this is our new policy good, but we have the old stale one still in there. And look, look, like <laughs> notepad is being blocked in enforcement mode using this old stale policy. And it is then immediately allowed to run um, per the new policy GUID that we deployed. So isn't this great? <laughs> oh, wait. So, oh, here's, here's block rules. Oh, okay. Interesting. So it seems to be taking, but why is it being blocked? All right. So let's look at the times here. 334, 334, 334, 17, 334. These are all 334, 17. Okay. Uh, but it's this one, this old stale one that is not taking effect. Um, so here's an idea. Uh, Brian, let's see. Well, if I were troubleshoot, I check the policy XML again, then delete all the policies from the CI folders, reboot, deploy again. Um, yeah, I mean, it's probably what, what we should be doing here. Um, I have one other way that we can um, potentially burn this with fire before refreshing using WMI. Okay, so I'm gonna use this as a little reference here. All right. Uh, get sim class, namespace, this and this class name this has a few methods attached to it delete okay so I'm going to change this to invoke sim method. Um, and the method name is delete. And that does not take any arguments. Um, that did not work because am I? because I'm not running elevated. Okay. Um, all right. Cool. So it looks like it deleted that. Let's um, burn the other ones down with fire as well. What was it called? CI policies, active. And the last one, all right. And then um, redeploy. Oh, all right, redeploy base block rules. And the um, merged rules. I'm taking note of those GUIDs, 40B431. Um, now we issued the delete command, so why don't we reboot now? I feel like this has worked previously, like issuing that delete method to like really compel 
uh, code integrity to say that like you really do want to delete the uh, currently active policy. I'm also not sure that I've ever transitioned from the old policy type to the new uh, multiple base policy format type. Okay. Hey, hey, we didn't get that profile error. So I think uh, I'm confident we made some progress here. All right. Um, oh, let's, so let's run our, what happened there? I thought I had MS build there. Okay. Oh, it's because I didn't do dot backslash, I think, to say, yes, execute this from the current working directory. All right. Get WDAC code integrity event. Let's just look at the user events since last policy refresh. All right. Uh, we got some of those uh, native images in there. Remember I said, you'll, you'll want to ignore those. I don't believe I mentioned that these are actually cached. So when you refresh a policy, any of those NGEND um, created PE files, you should only see those once. All right. So like when you reboot, um, you should not expect to see, like in this case, system.numerics.ni.dll to surface as an event again. Um, there is a caching mechanism in place that honestly, I don't know much about. Probably the only people who do are like a small group of people at Microsoft and James Forshaw, um, who can maybe speak up about that. But otherwise, um, that is what should be expected. Okay, so look. Um, all right, so here's another thing to consider. Well, let's go to the most recent event, all right? So, um, okay, Microsoft build.dll. Let's go to, let's scroll to the first notepad.exe that we tried to run right here, okay? So notepad, which is actually MS build, would have been blocked if we were out of audit mode. Um, and it originated the surface, uh, uh, sorry, the, um, the event surfaced via the, the block rules policy. Another interesting artifact though, which I still haven't figured out like exactly how this works is why you get two events. So we get the same event that comes from default Windows audit and the block rules policy. So let's see. See, this doesn't make sense to me because this policy would have otherwise allowed MS build to run because it is Windows signed, right? But this is the policy that explicitly denies that. So I get why this surfaces, but why it surfaces in a redundant fashion, but specifying the other policy that would have allowed it doesn't make sense to me. So, um, you know, take that for what it is. Uh, maybe we could get some clarification from Microsoft at some point. Um, these multiple policies, um, there's still some like subtle nuances that are not documented well that I don't have full confidence in just yet. So, um, but hopefully just by streaming all this and just bringing more attention to it, uh, Microsoft might um, get on the ball and uh, better, better document some of these uh, weird corner cases. Um, so flag CTF, um, is it because all policies have to allow and it just dumps each policy? Maybe, I don't know, but 
it's not intuitive and we could certainly use some clarification here because like this to me is the value of surfacing the policy name and the policy GUID in the first place so that you can clearly distinguish what the event, which policy the event corresponds to, right? So when it's redundant, like it kind of defeats the purpose of that in, in my opinion, okay? Cool. So um, we'll leave it at that. I got to run, really got to mow the lawn. And it's getting dark, so I better I better hustle. But thank you once again, everyone, for joining, for engaging. Um, again, you you are the reason that I'm coming back every week to do this. Um, your engagement and interest in this um, is what's going to keep me doing this for the long run. So thank you very much. Um, really appreciate it. And I will see you next week. Uh, and we should be back to our regularly scheduled two-hour program. All right. Thank you all. Take care.